So uh, thank you, Joe, for that introduction. And I want to thank uh, the Riley Institute and the Awe Institutes for inviting me to be here this evening to be with you. It's a great pleasure. I want to thank all of you for coming out uh, to share the experience. I have to see if I can know how the clicker works. I went in the wrong direction. Let me see. Ah, follow the arrow. There we go. So, um, so I noticed the theme for this uh, the series, uh, this year's series, is working together to fulfill the promise of education. Um, that's a wonderful sentiment. As we get into the story that will unfold uh, in the long shadow, you'll see that, that that promise is largely unfulfilled for many of Baltimore's children. And uh, in order to turn that around for them and for all of us collectively who care about them, it will require a concerted effort. It will require that we work together. So I'm going to be talking about a book project tonight that, uh, as Joe mentioned, is substantially uh, my life's work. Uh, this capstone publication, The Long Shadow, is the culminating statement of that project. It began way back in 1982, 82, uh, when my colleagues and I at Hopkins launched a study that was intended to cast a careful look on the experiences of Baltimore City public school children as they began their educational careers in first grade. Mike, we are sociologists by trade, and we're survey researchers. And so we started this project by drawing a, a representative random sample of children, just under 800 children, who were starting first grade that year in 20 Baltimore City public schools scattered throughout the city. Um, and we stayed with it for quite a few years. It was a quarter century project. It started in 1982. It ended in 2006 with our last contact with the uh, study participants. Uh, we successfully, at that point, uh, relocated and re-interviewed 80% of the original youngsters. Uh, we call that our mature adult survey. They're age 28, 29 at the time, six years old, no longer. Uh, we watched them grow up. Uh, we interviewed, interviewed them individually on many occasions over the years. We talked with their parents on many occasions. We talked with their teachers. Uh, we had splendid cooperation from the Baltimore City public school system, and we had access to school system records, which gave us uh, their achievement test scores, their report card marks, uh, deportment ratings. So over a 25-year period, we compiled a very substantial kind of database. We really did uh, track their lives as they unfolded uh, from early childhood into mature adulthood. And um, while we've had the good fortune of uh, pursuing any number of, of themes using this database as the vehicle in our publications, uh, this book, The Long Shadow, really is the capstone of it. Very fond of the cover image. Um, the Long Shadow is intended to convey the long shadow of family background. That is the conditions of family life early on and the importance of family conditions for moving children across very different life trajectories depending upon where they start life, start out in life. I personally, and my colleagues as well, have a somewhat expansive view of what we mean by family conditions and, the, and family background. Um, when you talk about family, the inclination, I think, is to think in terms of considerations at the interior of family life, whether it's an intact two-parent household, uh, whether the parents have steady employment uh, with a comfortable enough income to support a family. Uh, whether the parents are engaged in their children's learning and supportive of their children's learning. Uh, those kinds of considerations indeed are important, and we do monitor them in this work. Um, but the influence of family extends beyond the household. Uh, when children leave for school in the morning, uh, they go through the neighborhood of the, where they live, the surrounding neighborhood context, and when they arrive at school, they have access to the resources that are available to them. Parents decide, in deciding where they're going to live, parents decide the neighborhood context the children are exposed to, and also the quality and character of the schools that they attend. So um, for us, and in this project, uh, family is, uh, is a broad construction. Uh, it applies to the immediate circumstances of family life, as well as the neighborhood conditions and school conditions that children experience along the way. I'm actually going to start at the end 
these two quotes that I'll be sharing with you are, uh, they, they start out the last chapter of the book, chapter 9. Uh, when I've had the, uh, the pleasure and the opportunity to share this work with any number of audiences since its publication in mid-year 2014, I didn't always start my presentations this way. But um, I have to think that, almost, that all of you in the room have some sense of what transpired in Baltimore a little over a year ago with the Freddie Gray incident, who died tragically at the hands of the Baltimore police. I don't mean to pass judgment on that. These situations that are not unusual to Baltimore, they've been happening throughout the country, they're complicated, and every situation's different. But the Freddie Gray uh, experience and then the turmoil that followed ob obliged me to kind of step back and kind of think about what we learned through this 25-year project that might have relevance to the situation in Baltimore. Now, the book was published before Freddie Gray. It's not about Freddie Gray. But I think it contains important lessons uh, to be learned that have uh, relevance and resonance to what's happening in Baltimore today. And so some of that is captured in these two quotes. We asked our study participants uh, to reflect on their lives and um, their ideas about what it means to be successful, among other things. And these are fairly representative characteristic replies that we, that we heard. So Ken told us, I think I'm successful now because I'm happy, you know. I don't have a lot of money, you know. You know, I live paycheck to paycheck, but I'm happy because I come home every day the person I want to be with, you know. I pick up the phone, my parents are still there if I need to talk to them or if I want to talk to them. I'm happy, I'm comfortable. That's Ken. Dylan told us, I think my parents are successful. I mean, they're not rich or anything, but they were successful as far as like raising all those children, you know. And you know, even though we did like some things, you know, nobody did anything real major. And we all, we all still alive, you know. All of us are still alive. That's Dylan. These are, to me, interesting, indeed poignant, reflections on the meaning of success. There's no fancy house in the suburbs here, or a fancy car, or a high-paying job. Now, these young people want those things as well. But these are very substantial values. They're real. They're meaningful. And in the circumstances of their lives, they're not to be taken for granted. Census data or vital statistics data for Baltimore City tell us that in recent years, there's a 20-year difference in life expectancy, 20-year difference in life expectancy comparing across Baltimore's poorest neighborhoods and Baltimore's wealthiest neighborhoods. In round numbers, it's 86 years, 66 years. That's shocking. It certainly shocked me when I first encountered it. I hope it will feel you'll react the same way. 26 years. Probably won't surprise that the poorest neighborhoods in Baltimore are African American, and the wealthiest neighborhoods in Baltimore are substantially white. 20 year difference in life expectancy. A little closer to home in the sense of this project, I mentioned at the outset that we had a 20, 80 percent um, success rate in uh, relocating and re interviewing these children, all grown up as young adults. Now, 80% is none too shabby. We feel like we did a really good job, and we're proud of that. So we started with 790. We didn't, at age 20, 28, we had 667 completed interviews. That means we were unable to interview 123 of these youngsters, 123. We know of 26 known deceased in the group. That's more than 20% of the interviews that were not, not done we're done because these young people are no longer with us. And in all likelihood, that's an undercount because there are ones we couldn't find at all. These are the ones we know of. That's shocking, too. And I think it, it helps underscore what we heard from these young people when we talked with them. To be happy, to be comfortable, to be alive. It's not to be taken for granted. The book, The Long Shadow, really is not about those themes. It's about opportunities to achieve a comfortable standard of living in adulthood, young adulthood, in relationship to where you started out in life. We look at educational level of completed. We, we, we look at job experiences. We look at earnings. But we started out the chapter this way because we wanted to remind ourselves and we wanted to remind our readership that the conventional standards of success, while they're important, 
educational level, occupation, and so forth. Um, they're not all encompassing. And so we wanted to be respectful of what the voices we heard when we engaged with these young people to appreciate and value the standards of success that are meaningful to them. And in point of fact, these are meaningful to all of us in the room, but most of us are fortunate enough that, that we don't have to dwell on them, right? We can kind of take them for granted. Not all of us, but most of us. These young people can't take them for granted. And we wanted to recognize that, we wanted to respect it. And in the wake of Freddie Gray, I wanted to share that with you all. Okay. Here's another quote. This is Chip. We talked to Chip. And here's what he told us about how a really traumatic experience that happened to him when he was younger affected him. He told us about his older brother being gunned down when thugs invaded his house over a drug deal that went bad. Can you imagine being in the middle of that as a little kid? Here's what Chip told us. It was a month or two months that I would try to go to school, but I would leave because if I felt like I was, like I had to cry, I would leave. I wouldn't, <laughs> excuse me, I wouldn't cry in front of nobody. And that's a hurting feeling when you lose somebody that close. Indeed. In the book, we introduced this little clip of our conversation with, with Chip. Yeah, you have to forgive me. I know these kids. Uh, I, I was with them from when they were six years old, so this is not easy, this part of it. Um, we introduced this in a section of the book when we discussed how we, we, how we monitored stressful social change in the family life. And what we did there was a standard survey format approach. We talked to the parents, when, uh, and, and then when their children were a little older, we talked to the youngsters themselves. And we asked a dozen questions about whether any of these things had happened to them in, over the past year. And it was like uh, lose a family member to, uh, who passed away, or have a child who suffered serious illness, or lose a job, and you know, that kind of thing. It was a list of 12. And so, um, and then our, our measure of, set of, of family stress was we would tally up how many of those were affirmatively indicated. And so it was 1 to 12, and if you had an 8, you had experienced high stress that year. If you had a 2, you were lucky enough that you, know, you got off easy. So that is a very, very conventional way of monitoring stress in family life. And we used it in, our, um, in the survey analysis part of the project. But we, again, we wanted to recognize that this is that's a surface way of approximating what stress means. And so this is stress, up close and personal. And sadly, many, many of our young people growing up in the poorer neighborhoods of Baltimore are exposed to violence in their homes, in their neighborhoods, on the way to school. Yeah, so this is real stress. Now, to the book proper. Uh, it is a book about opportunities for upper mobility. You know, that's the sociology way of saying it, intergenerational mobility origins to destinations in life course perspective. When I was really, I'm retired now, I've been retired for a year and a half and I'm enjoying it. Uh, but when I was wearing my faculty member habit at Johns Hopkins University, that's the way I used to talk. Uh, thankfully, I started to outgrow that and I can kind of talk like a normal person now. So that is the agenda of the book and it's hardly original with us. So I'm a sociologist and when you hear sociology, a lot of people say, who cares what he thinks? You know, what are they? He's just a sociologist. Joseph Stiglitz is a Nobel laureate economist. And uh, just a little bit before uh, our book appeared, uh, he wrote an opinionator piece in the New York Times, and it was really promoting a book of his that had just recently come out. And Stiglitz, uh, uh, the perspective is, of his work was to compare the opportunities for upward mobility for poor children in the United States against the opportunities that are available to uh, children in other industrialized countries throughout the world. So it's a comparative perspective, the US versus these other countries. And here's what Stiglitz concludes, Nobel, poor, Nobel laureate economist. Remember that person you take seriously. <laughs> the life prospects of an American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in almost any other advanced industrialized economy. The life prospects of an American child 
are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in almost any other industrial, advanced industrial economy. That's a very sobering realization. And it flies in the face of our national ethos that says we are the land of opportunity. In other words, we're the meritocracy. If your children, if our children do what we tell them to do, work hard, play by the rules, listen to your parents, listen to your teachers, all sorts of good things can happen. And aspirationally, I share that. I suspect all of you in the room share that perspective. But the reality on the ground is that we fall short for too many of our young people. So Stiglitz, in his research, is looking at the United States versus other places, other parts of the world. This is the agenda of our research, but we're looking within, within Baltimore, but within uh, the United States, and Baltimore is a, as a, for instance. Uh, and our focus is to compare opportunities and how they're structured and how they're patterned across social lines. We compare the experiences of low-income children with the experiences of middle-class middle class children, all of whom began first grade in Baltimore City Public Schools. So when we talk about low-income versus middle-class, we're not talking about the wealthiest of the wealthy. In order to do that, we'd have to be, have extended our research to the surrounding Baltimore suburbs or to the private schools in, in the city. But these are all public school students at the outset. Nevertheless, there were sufficient, we we're able to make those comparisons, but uh, we're not capturing the extremes. Well, we're capturing the extremes at one end. We're capturing the extremes of poverty, but not the extreme, extremes of, of, of wealth and opportunity. We also compare the experiences of African American and white children and young adults, um, which is an interesting opportunity and one uh, rarely afforded. Uh, we, as I mentioned at the outset, we started by drawing a representative random sample of children starting first grade in 20 Baltimore City Public Schools. That means that our panel, our sample of 700 youngsters, by design allows us to make statements about conditions in Baltimore, broadly speaking. You know, it's a window on conditions citywide. And by virtue of the way we selected our sample, we have, well, I'll say about half of our children using the survey data we have and also information from school records, about half the children we classify as being uh, starting out in life in low-income families. Okay? The other half are not low-income. About a fourth of them are kind of in the middle range, and then the other fourth are um, better off. Solidly middle class is what that means. Now, of the half that are low-income, 40% are white. 40% are white. Most folks, when they hear about urban disadvantaged, right, immediately think communities of color. African Americans, and in some parts of the country, increasingly now in Baltimore, uh, Latino or Hispanic, right, communities of color. In point of fact, poor whites are a presence in places like Baltimore, and in cities like Baltimore throughout the country. But they're off the radar when it comes to research on the urban poor. You just don't see attention directed to the experiences of poor whites. We direct attention to the experiences of poor whites because we have a good, a, a good grip on who they are and what they've experienced along the way by virtue of the way this project was launched. So we're interested in comparisons across uh, lines of family income, in, in terms of uh, li across lines of race, ethnicity, and by gender, boys and girls, young men and young women, grown up. We're interested in, in op how opportunities are patterned along those lines, but also at what's referred to as the intersection of the three. It's not just whether you're poor or whether you're white or African American or whether you're a wo young woman. Conditions also vary for poor African American men, distinctively. So we try to put those pieces together. Okay. This is the perspective that we bring to bear. Um, it's not original with us, and the picture doesn't appear in the book, but we certainly acknowledge it in the book. It's, it's a Richard Jesser article that appeared in a, in a publication called The American Psychologist way back in 1993, and it is, it, it is his overlapping spheres of influence perspective. So it's a perspective on uh, children's uh, personal development, academic development, and social development as it plays through time, starting in childhood. Do I, have a, I don't have a pointer. Starting a child, pre-adolescence through adolescence and into young adulthood. So it's exactly our time frame. This, this image comes from his publication. We didn't make this up. I wish we could take credit for it, because I think it's just so tremendously rich in import. What he says is that the child, at the center of it all, 
is like a socialization sponge. He or she kind of soaks up the experiences in, her, in his or her immediate realm of experience. And what children experience up close and personal day in and day out are family life, their neighborhoods, and their schools. Right? So those are the overlapping spheres of influence. And, they, and the, the, their developmental import is ongoing in young people's lives, just all along the way. Right? Jesser also points out that family, neighborhood, and uh, school are embedded in a larger socio-structural socio context. Now, socio-structural sounds, but it's Baltimore City over a roughly 30-year period, 1980 to 2005, 6 um, It's situated, the experiences of these young people are situated in time and place. And Baltimore City, the transformation of Baltimore City over this period of time, actually starting before 1980, but that's when our children kind of came into the picture. It's not a pretty story. It's the classic deindustrialization script. And uh, I'll say a bit more about that in a second, but to anticipate, it's the surrounding context does not augur well for uh, the opportunities that would be afforded to poor children growing up in places like Baltimore City. So that's the, the imagery. Now, there's nothing particularly, in, in, there's nothing particularly, what do you think? There's nothing particularly um, innovative or novel about it to that point, but the overlap is. The overlap is important, and that's what we take away from it. It's often the case there are large literatures on family conditions and how they affect children's development. There are literatures on neighborhood conditions and how they affect children's development. And there are liter literatures on school conditions and how they affect children's development. And we've contributed to those separate literatures along the way. But in point of fact, children don't experience them as silos like that. They experience these three institutional settings holistically. It's the mosaic of their lives, right? They all come together. And it's a... It's a false divide to separate them that way. And Jesser's point is that the overlap of experience in these three institutional settings is itself compelling. And the easiest way to see that is that so many of our children in our study, not all, but many, grew up in poor families, lived in poor high poverty neighborhoods, and attended schools where the children are of substantially similar background, high poverty schools. Poverty at home, poverty in the neighborhood, poverty at school. We know that each of those separately is a risk factor. Risk factor for what? For struggling at school and for having a challenging life uh, over the long haul. Each of them separately is a risk factor. When you put them together, the odds multiply. Yeah. Many of Baltimore's children, and it's not peculiar to Baltimore, are triply disadvantaged. It multiplies. That's the overlap. Now, a bit about the background context of Baltimore City. Deindustrialization, I think we all have a sense of that. Um, but what's easy to forget is that before Baltimore City and places like Baltimore deindustrialized, they, they had to industrialize. You know, they had to be at the top before they went down. And it wasn't too, too long ago, the late 50s into the 1960s, that Baltimore City was the economic powerhouse of the middle Atlantic states. This image up here is the, Bal it's the Bethlehem Steel Mill out in Sparrows Point. At the peak of the World War II mobilization and for a decade after, it was the largest steel mill in the world. In the world, 35,000 people worked at Best Steel. Employment at Best Steel was the golden opportunity for young men, mainly, without the benefit of a college degree, often without even a high school degree, to get a good paying job, steady work with benefits that would allow them to comfortably support a family. Right? The, the historians, the economic historians of the day, refer to this as the emergence at the time of the blue collar elite. Okay? Over the years, Best Steel suffered several bankruptcies, and just a year or so ago, it was broken up and sold for scrap metal. Those 35 jobs aren't there any longer. Likewise, all those jobs, high skill, high wage jobs, on the docks, in the automobile assembly plants, in the uh, airplane assembly plants, most of those are gone. And also during this time, Baltimore City was hemorrhaging much of its population and much of its wealth. Here's a, uh, 
an excerpt from a, uh, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which is a large philanthropic foundation that's focused, where its focus is helping poor communities uh, in places like Baltimore. And they're headquartered nationally in Baltimore. They issued a report in 2010 which kind of did the, gave an overview of this transformation of Baltimore City. A perfect storm, they characterized it, of crippling trends and tragic events, the dramatic loss to manufacturing jobs and tax base, the ruinous riots of 1967 and 1968, the exodus of first white then African American middle class families, the sequential epidemics of heroin, crack cocaine, and HIV, the intensified crime and gang, well, you get it, it's not a pretty picture, right? The end result has been an ever deepening cycle of disinvestment and decline. You know, from the Jesser's perspective, this is the st socio-structural backdrop to our children's coming of age. Right? Not everywhere in Baltimore, not all of Baltimore's children, but the high poverty neighborhoods of Baltimore, for sure. That's what the Casey Foundation, how the Casey Foundation characterized this period of time when our children were growing up and coming of age. Here's what we heard from some of our study participants. Again, we asked them to reflect back on what life was like in the communities where they're living growing up. I'll just share the one, I'll just read the one from Sona. They're, sadly, they're repetitive. Sona says, where I lived, it was more or less like, I guess you'd say, family-oriented, because everybody knew everybody. When you hear everybody talking about how someone could spank you or whether they were family or not, well, that's what it was like back on the block. And maybe one or two parents was watching us and stuff. Then after a while, the neighborhood started going down. Basically, the kids were getting badder and badder, and the people you thought was really nice were changing. You know what I mean? Well, I think we have a sense of what Sona means. Yeah. One of the things I've learned from the experience of working on this project over, it's actually more than 25 years, if you count the planning, planning years and then the taking stock years. One of the things I've learned is that there's a lot of street wisdom out there. You know, we hear out of the mouths of, mouth of babes. These young people are very much aware of what's going on around them. They might not speak in the same language as academic sociologists, but they understand. And they can convey it in their own terms. So again, if I put on my academic hat, I would, what, I, what Sona is telling me, what she's saying in more graphic terms than I could, is that what she experienced was a decline of social capital at the neighborhood level, a weakening of social integration or social cohesion. Poor neighborhoods can be strong neighborhoods. They can be a foundation for moving up. But poor neighborhoods that are highly distressed in the way that Sona is describing are not a good foundation for moving up. And too many of Baltimore's children experience life early, in the early years in this kind of neighborhood. So that's the sense of the backdrop. In the foreground are the stories that the long shadow um, tells. We actually, it's a complicated project. There are lots of ways that you could have sliced and diced it. And what we wanted to try to be faithful to the the lived experience of the young people that, who's, who are helping us understand what it's like to grow up in these conditions. And we've organized the book around what we call two success narratives or themes. One has to do with opportunities for upward mobility through the educational system, like what this conference theme is about, education. Yeah. We thought the book was going to be about that, because as Joe mentioned at the outset, you know, by trade, my colleagues and I are sociologists of education. We study educational issues. We try to understand how schools work. And we thought this was the book, what the book was going to be about. As a success narrative, we've got, if in case I run out of time, uh, there's it's very straightforward takeaway points. And they're captured in some of these numbers. There are numbers in the book. I hope that's not too off-putting, but that's the way we do our work. There are numbers in the book. So at the end of it all, when we asked these young people about their educational experience and how far they'd gone through school, what schools they intended, and that sort of thing, and we compiled all those data and we coded it up, then we looked across social lines. We found that 45% of the middle, children from middle class, parent, middle class families when they started out in life, and again, these aren't the wealthiest of the wealthy, solid middle class. At age 28, 45% of those children had a bachelor's degree or beyond. There are actually a half dozen PhDs and maybe 15 or 16 master's degrees. 45% of them had a BA degree or beyond. Children in middle class families. Just 4%, don't even need one hand, 4% of the children who started out life in low income families had a bachelor's degree at age 28. That's a tenfold difference in degree completion. Tenfold difference in degree completion. 
the vast majority of these young people weren't going to be getting on in their lives with the benefit of a higher education credential. Now, Baltimore and the county surrounding it have a very extensive two-year community college system. And two-year schools are intended by design. They're supposed to be accessible and affordable for these kinds of kids, right? If you include in the mix Associate of Arts degrees, the typical two-year community college degree, that 4% goes up to 5.5%. Yeah? OK. There's a lot that goes into that if you want to try to understand why so many of these children fall short of what we would want for them, of what their parents would want for them, and what they want for themselves. And I'll say a bit about that as we move on. But I want to make sure that I make mention of the second success narrative, because it took us on a process of discovery. About half the book is about the second success narrative, but we hadn't anticipated that going on, going in. What caught our attention and obliged us to elevate the issue was what we saw when we organized the information that we were provided by these young people about their work experience as young adults. Right? We asked them what, what their most recent job was, what kind of work they did, how much they made, uh, how long they'd been on the job, and so forth. So we pulled that information together, and we looked at it. And what we found, among other things, was another 45%. 45% of the white men of working class background, white men of working class background, that's that intersectionality, it's race, gender, and social class. 45% of the white men of working class background as young adults were working in the high skill, high wage, industrial and construction crafts and trades. They were plumbers electricians, auto mechanics, welders, brick masons, kinds of jobs that we were told disappeared with, with deindustrialization. Well, that sector of the economy has greatly diminished, but it's not altogether gone. What's really important is who's, who has access to those kinds of jobs. White men of working class background do. That's the blue collar elite. Remember back in the day? Still the blue collar elite today, although we tend not to, be, we tend not to think of it in those terms. In comparison, young African-American men of very similar background growing up, 15% of them were working in that sector of the economy. That's 45% versus 15%. Now, that's not the tenfold drift difference in baccalaureate degree completion, but that's a huge disparity. And if you look within, which we did, the African-American men who were working in that sector of the economy on average were earning 22,000. This is young adults in 2005, 2006. They were earning $22,000 annually. The white men in that very same sector were earning $43,000 annually. So the whites were earning over twice what the African Americans were earning. The African American men working in that sector of the economy, construction and industrial crafts and trades, were relegated to low wage, low skilled, dirty work. Yeah. There is a sense of history there, because if you look back to the 50s and, 50, and 60s during Baltimore's industrial heyday, African Americans working in the steel mills, working on the docks, working in the auto assembly plants, working in, you name it, they were relegated to low wage, low skilled, dirty work. Yeah? It's still the case substantially today. So we have two stories. Why is it that poor kids aren't more successful in school relative to middle class children? And why is it that African-American men, African-American women, African-American white women of working class background aren't as successful in the world of work as are white men of working class background? So the first is a story about realizing success and prospects for upper mobility by doing well in school and using that as a springboard. The second is about getting on in life without the benefit of a college degree and finding good work that pays well and provide steady employment. So there's a workplace story, there's a school story. And let's see, how am I doing in terms of time? I need to pace myself. 15 minutes, we're golden. <laughs> uh, I'm going to skip that. So, <laughs> but I'll, uh, so. Um, so, the first part of it is education and educational opportunity and educational success. Uh, we're going to hear about um, summer learning and after, after school uh, programming opportunities here locally. And so I wanted to try to work that into the story. And it's, it works in, well, uh, one of the 
One of the strands of our research that's been especially impactful has been our work on summer learning and summer learning loss. Can I see, do those of you in the room, have many of you heard the expression summer slide? Yeah, okay. Well, we introduced that expression, and I take some pride in saying that. I'm not a braggart, but that's been a really important contribution. And here's what it's about. These are reading comprehension test scores on the California uh, reading comprehension battery that was administered by the Baltimore City Schools, public schools at the time our research began. It's not super pretty, but it conveys full of first grade, the lower bar, I guess it looks dark blue. Those are, that's the reading comprehension of average score of children from, middle, from low income families. The one above it, I have no idea what color that is, but it's pretty. Is the, this is from the fall of first grade, very first testing occasion for these children in their educational experiences. That's the average for children of middle class background. And the, 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 the other group is suppressed, but they're right squarely in the middle. So in the fall of first grade, at the time of school entry, poor children were scoring a half grade level behind in terms of reading comprehension on the standardized test. Half grade level behind at the fall of first grade. Now, that doesn't sound so bad. Maybe we can get in there and do something about a half grade level behind. The rest of the data points, their end of year scores, the spring scores, at the end of each of the, grade, each of the years of elementary school. At the end of fifth grade, the year before the transition to middle school, the average poor child was scoring three grade equivalents behind the average not poor child. Three grade equivalents. So a half grade equivalent over the course of five years has exploded the three grade equivalents. I promise you to be reading at a third or fourth grade level just before transitioning to middle school is not a good place to be. But that's the experience of way too many of these children. That's what it looks like over the grade span of the elementary school years. Here's what it looks like, I think, if I got the slides right. Here's what it looks like when you look at summer learning separately from school year learning. Now, this, we're able to do this because in the test score records, the Baltimore City System was doing fall and spring testing, testing, twice annual testing. So you can calculate the progress made on reading comprehension, which is fundamental building block of all later learning. You can calculate school year learning by looking at the test score at the end of first grade relative to where it was at the, at the beginning of first grade, fall to spring. That's school year learning. Now, if you're following the same children over time as we did, and you're fortunate enough to have access to the to these data, you can calculate summer learning by looking at where they were at the start of second grade against where they had been at the end of first grade. And that's summer learning. It's actually a very simple exercise, but these are rare data, I promise you, and they're very revealing. So the top panels, those are cumulative reading comprehension gains across the five years of elementary school. Elementary school, pulling the summer period out. And they're stacked. So I, I have long arms, so I can't get up there. But the one, that's the average first year gain of low income children. And then the second panel is the first and, cumulative first and second year gain of low income children. And you go across the one that's five. That's from first grade to fifth grade, cumulative reading comprehension gains across the entirety of the elementary school years. Poor children, middle income children. The gains they're registering while they're in school, they're practically indistinguishable. These kid, poor kids are keeping up during the school year when they have access to the learning resources and opportunities that are available to them at school. Right? They're keeping up. One important takeaway point, and I'll share it with you, is that poor children are capable learners because they're learning. Yeah, They're doing it. These are standardized achievement test scores, the currency of the realm. But at year's end and at the end of elementary school, they haven't kept up because they were behind when they started first grade, and they fall behind over the summer months when they don't have access to the learning resources that are available to them at school, and where their learning is dependent on what's available to them in their poor families and in their poor communities. They're not moving ahead. We're not talking about rocket science here. We're talking about the fundamental building blocks, learning your letters, learning to put them together. You know? So that happens. At least in some family circumstances, that can be a home curriculum as well as a school curriculum, but not in poor families. Poor kids aren't picking up those skills on their own as much as their parents would like them to. So these are cumulative, these are cumulative summer learning aids, the four summers between the five elementary school years. They don't look cumulative for poor kids because <laughs> they're treading water, that summer slide, that summer setback. They might, on average, pick up a point 
one summer and then lose a couple points the next summer, which means they're scoring lower at the beginning of the next school year than they had been at the end of the previous one. Middle class children, and again, we're not talking about the wealthiest of the wealthy, reading comprehension. Their scores are improving, their capabilities are improving, their skills are improving. It's more fundamental than their scores. That's just a number on a piece of paper. What they can do with their, with their, with their academic abilities, what their reading comprehension, they're continuing to develop their skills every summer, every summer, steadily. And that's where these poor kids are falling behind. The summer slide, the summer setback, is a family opportunity shortfall. It's the long shadow of family background, a manifestation of that. There are many manifestations of it. Here's what it looks like if you put those two pieces together. And this is beyond our capability, but Time Magazine has people that are well paid to do this kind of thing. So this research and, and ours got picked up by Time Magazine in an article that appeared a few years ago, and, called, and they entitled it The Case Against Summer. Now, I have nothing more. <laughs> I don't want to make a case against summer. Summers are great. But we, what I would wish is that poor kids had the same kinds of enrichment opportunities and learning opportunities over the summer that not poor kids have. So let's, let's put our summers to good use. This is a characteristic zigzaw pattern that we saw. Uh, and now we have the group of intermediate level family income included. And you can see that they're squarely in between. Um, so the poor kids at the bottom, the not poor kids at the top. Poor kids, they make good strides during, this, during the school year, then they fall off during the summer. Good strides during the school year, fall off during the summer. It just repeats itself, right? Summer learning loss. And when you put it all together, this is what you see in terms of so, to, total summer learning gains. Now, you, the metric isn't going to mean anything to you. They're, these are scale scores and the way the California Achievement Test Battery was calibrated. It's what happens when you go from a half grade level behind to three grade levels behind over the elementary school years. Almost the entirety in that, of that increase in the achievement gap across social lines, we all talk about the achievement gap, that's what this is. Almost the entirety of the increase in the achievement gap across social lines traces to differential summer learning opportunities during the elementary school years. So. Uh, yep, let me get back. So, but it's not just what you see in California achievement test scores, that's just the tip of a very deep iceberg. Poor kids who suffer summer step back and summer slide and suffer a deficit of good learning opportunities in their homes and in their neighborhoods. As first graders, they're more likely to repeat a grade. We have a book on grade retention that was published for They're more likely to be assigned to receive special education services. When they get to middle grades, they're more likely to be assigned to low level remedial classes as opposed to advanced academic classes. They're much more likely to drop out of high school, and they're much less likely to go on to college. So something that starts out as early as first grade stays with them all along the way. It haunts them. It follows them all their lives. But the challenges that these young people face and their families say, face aren't just, just of an academic character. Okay? They also have, there also are externalities that weigh on them. And so, I mentioned that only 4% of our poor children had a bachelor's degree at age 28. 5.5% if you include AA degrees. Many of these young people had fire in the belly. They understood the importance of going to college and of lifelong learning. When we talked to them as young adults, 80%, 80% of the entire group said that they intended to get additional education as young adults, including 85% of those who didn't even have a high school, have high school certification at that age. Think of it, 85% of high school permanent, we call them permanent high school dropouts, they don't even have GEDs. 85% of them say they're gonna continue in school in some capacity. That's really quite extraordinary. About a third, a third of our poor children started down the post-secondary path, but so few of them were able to see it through to completion for reasons much like the story, Kim's story, about the practical hardships that they have to overcome in staying the course in college, even in accessible, affordable community colleges. So Kim, now it's five minutes. <laughs> okay, so Kim had a baby when she was in school. It's not uncommon for young people like ours. African-American young women and white young women, poor white young women in Baltimore, babies at a young age. Uh, she graduated on time though, in the high class rank, which set her apart from many of her peers. And she continued on into a community college. She tried three times to, see, to, to complete community college, but every, every time she couldn't stay the course. It was her daughter needed her attention, 
finances. It's not just tuition. It's covering books. It's transportation. There's a whole package. So Kim, she had fire in the belly. She persevered. She worked hard at it. She just could not see it through. When we talked to her at age 28, what she said was, just sometimes I get frustrated, frustrated because I like when I want something, I want it now. You know I want, and there's a lot of things that stand in my way. Like I mean, I don't mean to say she stands in my way, referring to her daughter, but she has to come first, you know. I'm sure if I didn't have her, I probably would be in law school right now. Well, that's a counterfactual. Who knows whether she'd be in law school, but I actually have to say, what I have, my sense of what, of Kim's character and determination, she'd be, some, she'd be in a better place, I have no doubt, even if she didn't quite make it to law school. So there are all these practical obstacles that also have to be, require our attention. Okay, so now I only have a, like a minute and a half, probably, or two minutes, what do I got? So I'm gonna say a bit about, about this second success narrative, the white working class men who seem to be doing so much better than everybody else of working class background. I'm gonna focus on men African-American and white men, but because there's not enough time to get into the gender part of it, but there's an interesting gender. You know, women, young women from, of working class background aren't, aren't doing much better either in their own uh, labor um, than our African-American men. And we can, if we have time, I can say a bit more about that. But the figures that I gave you earlier about 45% versus 15% and the African-Americans earning half of what the whites were earning, that was at age 28. But there's actually a story about vocational development that's e is equally as compelling as is the story about academic development. We all know about acad acad academic development starts you know, as early as you can monitor it and, and the issues play out over time. It's also the case that workplace opportunities have a long trail to them. So when we talked to these young people when they were in high school about their summer jobs and their part-time jobs, 21% 21, 21 of white men of working class backgrounds said that they were employed in the industrial and, uh, and, and construction, skilled crafts and trades, over a fifth. Not a single young African American man had that kind of employment experience. Now these young guys were not electricians and auto mechanics and plumbers and welders. They weren't that, but they were helping out. They were helping out an older brother. They were helping out a neighbor across the street. They were helping out somebody that they, the family knew from church. They had opportunities to get this kind of experience that young black men living in, in um, in uh, neighborhood, neighborhoods that are bereft of those kinds of opportunities and not having access to social networks that could help in those, open these doors. The young black men didn't have access to that. So these white guys, they were getting good experience, they were building up their skills, and they were forming relationships with, some, with somebody who could sponsor them, mentor them and sponsor them to help open doors later. White guys had that, African American men didn't. It's a story about social networks and family ties. Then at age 22, which is our young adult survey, it was 30% versus 8% working in that area, and then at age 28, 45. So it's the same kind of exploding achievement gap, but it's actually an experience gap in the world of work for young, in, young persons growing up in Baltimore without, and who are trying to find, find a path in life without the benefit of a college degree. It's developmental, it's, and it it's, uh, plays a large role in determining quality of life in young adulthood. How does this happen, you might ask? That's a rhetorical question. Well, here's one of the ways it happens. At age 22, we asked everybody how they found the jobs that they had, their, their, their current or most recent employment. And we asked them, um, we classified what they had to say in terms of uh, they had got help from family, they got help from friends, and they, got help, they had to do it on their own. Now, these aren't mutually exclusive because you could have gotten help well, every which way. But these are white men of working class background, African American men of working class background, the whites were much more likely to say they got help through family. The whites were much more likely to say they got help from friends. The African American, young African American men were much more likely to say they did it on their own. And to be on your own is not a good place to be if you're young and if you're black and if you're living in a high poverty neighborhood in Baltimore City. And it's not a good place to be and that's not a very good profile if the opening doors is dependent, is dependent on who you know and on, dependent on the goodwill of prospective employers. Now this isn't in our survey, but we know from the liter broader literature that employers in the non-college labor market are much more likely to ask about a criminal justice record of African American applicants. They're much more likely to tell you in surveys 
that they are distrustful of young African-American men in terms of their being honest, in terms of their being reliable, in terms of their being good workers. They harbor these misgivings. And so they're reluctant to take on these kinds of guys. And when prospective employers are reluctant to take on these kinds of guys, what happens? Those doors are open to young white men of working class background that have sponsorship, that have experience, and that have started to build up their skill set. So it is a, it's a social network opportunity. Um, let me say one other thing. Uh, again, it, it goes back to the, what I think of as the distorted image of what it means, what it's like to be poor and black in places like Baltimore. The young white men of working class background that we just saw have vastly superior employment opportunities. Their arrest and conviction rates are comparable to those of the African American men. These guys are not saints. And in terms of self-reported, what we call problem behaviors, they have a much higher rate of self-reported marijuana use, of heavy drug use, and of binge drinking than do the African-American men. So these guys aren't saints. But those sorts of missteps along the way don't throw them off track forever, yeah? because they have folks that can help them. And they have access to employment opportunities where they're willing to give, the employers are willing to give them a second or a third chance. Young black men who do these things, it can haunt them forever. They don't get beyond it because it throws up impediments, impenetrable barriers that they can't break through, barriers to opportunity. Well, we have, a, we have an account. This is Aaron. This is Chip. I don't know if you can read it, but I'm running out of time. It says, stop, please. Let me just, so. <laughs> Chip had a father who could get him a summer job while he was in high school, and that became a career opportunity for him. Aaron had a lot of barriers, and it's hard to single out one and only one that might have made the difference, but he didn't have a father who could, get, who could open a door for him, and clearly that's in the mix. So I want to take, in my time remaining, come Sylvester stuff, I want to come full circle to the Freddie Gray incident because that's how I started and I want to wind, wind up that way. If you bear with me for another minute or two. Um, these two success narratives, they're not just words on paper, they're real in people's lives. So if you see the experiences of young people like those we studied, plan A is to get through school and use that as a vehicle for moving on. Plan B, if you can't get through school, but you still need to get out and have a good, good, comfortable life, plan B is to get a decent job, steady work that pays well without the benefit of a college degree. Okay. Poor children in Baltimore, very few of them are following plan A. Poor African-American children in Baltimore, very few of them are following plan B. What's our plan C for people like this? We don't have a plan C. We don't have a plan C. So these young people look around and they see what we see, or maybe they see it with greater clarity because they're in the middle of it. Then in Baltimore and in places like Baltimore, well, you see the media and it's unrelenting. From one week to the next, there's an account of some young person of color who's dying at the hands of the police. And then it happens in Baltimore. It happens in a place where there's a long history of tension between police and community at least the minority community. That's a triggering point. That's a flashpoint. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of pent up anger that's looking for an outlet. And I do believe what we saw in Baltimore during the Freddie Gray, in the wake of Freddie Gray, was an expression of that anger. These young people, we, you know, we would wish that they would channel it in a different way. But they're young. These are kids in the main. Not our kids. Our kids were in their mid-30s and late 30s by that time. But these were teenagers and very young adults in the early 20s. And they were on the streets, and this is what happened. And I would hazard this, yes, so that's all tamped down. There's been a lot of interest in Baltimore in trying to figure out how to do better and to kind of build up these communities and, and very sincere and, and good work going on. But nothing fundamental has changed. We haven't figured out how to do the plan A better for these young people. And we haven't figured out how to do the plan B better for these young people. If there's a plan, P, plan C, it's on the streets. It's dealing drugs and it's getting in trouble. Right? 
Um, I'm worried that if we can't collectively figure out how to do a better job of opening up meaningful opportunity for these young people, what happened in Baltimore is going to happen again. It might not be Baltimore. It might be Detroit. Yeah, it might be Columbia, South Carolina. Um, it won't necessarily be tomorrow or next week. It might be next year or two or three years ago. But it's going to happen again because the same frustrations are there percolating, percolating. And you never know when and you never know where, but you can almost count on it. There will be a precipitating incident that will blow the lid off that pot. And I hope that we can learn from experience and commit to doing better doing better for these young people, and in the process, we're actually doing better for ourselves collectively as a community. So that's the, uh, I ran over by a few minutes. What are you going to do, shoot me? <laughs> Thank you.